So if you don't have hot chocolate, um, sitting in the back corner by Gary and Chong is some hot chocolate. So please do help yourself. It's a cold day. And uh, we all need to be warm. So, year of science. Um, the, the year of science, which is how we get to be where we are in this room today, is a province-wide celebration. And Langara is an active partner. We have um, celebrated the 40th on 49th. Were you here in the fall? Yeah. In the sort of drizzly rain mm -hmm. with the hot dogs? Mm -hmm. Did you go into the student union and see the science piece? <coughs> the nurse piece? Well, that was, that, that was one of the initiatives that, uh, that the maths and science, that the faculty of science here at Langara undertook as part of the year of science celebration. Uh, Langara's planned activities for year of science would not be possible without the hard work of the instructors in the maths and science division and I'd like to thank them very much. And I'd also like to thank the division chair of maths and science, Gerda Krauss, who has put together with her faculty the programs that uh, you're gonna see throughout the week, the different speakers who are coming in to talk about different aspects of science. And um, I, I now wanna talk a little bit about Science Works, this particular week of presentations by professionals who got their start by studying science. Um, this event is the second. Did people go to the computing science event just earlier up on the third floor? Excellent, very good. And that was uh, by Dr. David Usher of Mozilla Messaging. Messaging. And uh, now we are going to uh, have a speaker who will talk to us a little bit about, about health sciences. And uh, Dr. Rekha Gustafson is a very accomplished woman and a very good friend. I first met Reka when I was in the pediatrician's office about 15 years ago. I brought my twin boys in, and uh, they were infants at the time, and she was a medical student working with uh, the pediatrician of the day, and she actually had a son who was just about the same age as my boys. And so it was um, only slightly surprising that the, the three boys should show up at the daycare together, and that's where we renewed our friendship. Rika has a bachelor's degree in chemistry, which is a very smart and good thing for her to do, as I'm a chemist myself. And uh, she went on to get a master's degree in chemistry, which was also very brilliant. But then she strayed. She became a doctor, and then she did uh, graduate work. She has her master's in health sciences and epidemiology. She's a medical health officer for the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority and a director of communicable disease control in Vancouver. And she's an assistant clinical professor in the School of Population and Public Health out at UBC. She's involved in surveillance prevention and control of communicable diseases, outbreak management, and interesting, interesting refugee health. So she, when I Googled her up, I found out that she has had comments about flu shots, typical flu season, six-in-one vaccine, which is sort of quite new, uh, MRSA and C. difficile, HIV, AIDS, the toxic bus incident from 2004, so if you remember when the bus stopped on Granville and 49th and everybody thought they were sick, the rig oversaw that, and 100,000 condoms given out in the Athletes Village during the 2010 games here in Vancouver. That was a quote from the Huffington Post. So um, I hope Rekha, and I know she's actually told me this, She's going to share her journey with you, and you're going to find that it had many challenges for Reka and surprising turns. So the takeaway message for you today about science is that it can take you places that you don't even know about, and you just have to let it happen. So, um, oh, she's also, I'm hoping for a little bit more detail on the athletes. So I hope you will join with me in welcoming Reka. gratified to see all of you, you file in until I heard someone say that your teacher next door made you come. But nevertheless, <laughs> I appreciate that you're here. And I'm, I am going to tell you a little bit about what I do and, and how I got here and and the importance of, a, of an undergraduate and uh, education in science to how I ended up where I am. So um, 
As Margaret said, I'm a medical health officer, which sounds very officious, but what that really is is I'm a doc for the public health. So when there is somebody with, a, with an infectious disease, they go to their doctor and their doctor looks after, after them. I look after everybody else around them. Because whenever you have an infectious disease, or particularly a communicable disease, you got it from somewhere. And wherever you got it from, people around you can also get it. And you, and you could have transmitted to them. So because it is the person with the illness that goes to the doctor, and the doctor doesn't, doesn't have access to everybody else around them, there is, there's this one called public health, which is, looks, which is the branch of medicine that looks after the community. So that's what I do. It's really fun. It is one of, it's, it's, it's a really, really fun way to practice medicine because you're out there in the community and things, and, and unlike doing a, another specialty of medicine, like let's say you do nephrology, then every single person who comes into your office has a kidney problem. But uh, I don't know what kind of problems are gonna come in in the morning. So I did have the toxic bus. The toxic bus was great. Um, the toxic bus was uh, one person who probably had gastroenteritis on the bus. <coughs> managing to convince everybody else on the bus that there was a terrorist attack, and it was a beautiful <laughs> example of a mass panic attack, is what it was, mass hysteria. Um, but <coughs> nevertheless, it, it can be that, it can be hepatitis A, it can be um, an evacuated building, the Electra building, I don't know if you all saw it just before Christmas, the Electra building was evacuated um, in downtown Vancouver, I was involved in that, it can be, um, ordinary communicable diseases like influenza, it can be HIV, it can be a lot of interesting things. But how did I actually end up here? Well, um, I graduated from high school, like everybody else. Well, I was actually born in Hungary, but that has nothing to do with anything. And I came to Canada when I was 13, and I learned English, which is helpful, and, um, and went to UBC. And um, I remember way back when, sort of having an inkling that I wanted to go to medicine, but I had very, I was Eastern European father with very strong ideas about what you're gonna be when you grow up. And you're a girl and you can do math and you're going to. So I was, I was guided into science. And at that time, I didn't necessarily think that was a good thing, but I now realize that there was a lot of value in what I learned at that time. So I did an undergraduate degree in chemistry, but I took quite a lot of mathematics as well. So I didn't just go up to second year calculus, I actually explored mathematics quite a bit further. Um, and so I did an undergraduate degree in chemistry and graduated. And um, then I went on to do a master's. Now I ended up doing a master's in theoretical chemistry because I was basically frightening in the lab. <laughs> and most of the TAs had to follow me around because once something that looked like nitrogen to dry so acetone off with, it actually was a faded H2 and apparently you're not supposed to dry acetone with that. So anyway, I, I got a little scary. I never did ma manage to make lovely pink flakes in organic chemistry like so many people do. Mine was always a brown sludge. But so I decided to go into theory. And theory was good for me because it was quite mathematical and I ended up doing a master's here again at UBC with a wonderful supervisor who, uh, where I was calculating how a theoretical liquid lines up to it next to a theoretical <coughs> wall. And, um, and it seems very obscure, and it was, and it was super fun, and it was really only, as far as I could tell at that point, was only gonna lead me to an academic career, which would have been actually really quite wonderful to have an academic career. But it, was, it seemed very well set, there was a very well set path. And I was absolutely inspired by my master's, <coughs> my master's degree, and I really enjoyed it. And then I went off to Pittsburgh following my husband, who was also doing a PhD, to start a PhD. And it was there that I sort of had this epiphany that I actually was inspired more by the people around me and the way they thought about science than the actual topic. In other words, it wasn't really the specific topic for me. So here I was, 20-something, uh, 20 24, 25, in Pittsburgh, don't recommend it. Um, I mean, 24 to 25 is great. Pittsburgh, <laughs> <laughs> Pittsburgh is a bit of a, a, bit, a, bit of a question mark. And having done a master's in, in chemistry and wondering what I was going to do next, and in a way, not being right where I was brought up and not being sort of constrained by the expectations of the people who were around me, I got to reinvent myself. So I actually ended up volunteering in a hospital and doing a couple of things, I got to go into operating rooms. To this day, I do not know how they, I managed to get myself in there, but I was actually in the operating rooms watching people 
um, do throat surgery, and also worked in a bone marrow transplant unit where people were having their last ditch effort to uh, cure them of cancers that uh, weren't responding to treatment. It's where I met a 19 year old uh, girl who had breast cancer. Yeah, I also met a woman with, uh, with two daughters who was in her 50s, um, again, having this last ditch effort for treatment, whose only um, goal in life was to make it to his daughter's, to her daughter's wedding and to one day visit Hope, BC, which I thought was very interesting given that she was in Pittsburgh. Clearly she didn't know what Hope looked like. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I decided not to be so rich on her and told her that that was a really good goal. And, um, and so I realized that really um, there was a part, something in medicine that really drew me, which was talking to people and talking to individuals. So one of the things that that was interesting for me is I had one really, really bad year in undergrad. I mean, really bad. I generally don't do things halfway, so I crashed and burned in third year. And that was, a, that was not necessarily a, um, an easy thing to overcome. So suddenly deciding that I'm not going to go to medical school um, with this blemish on my um, undergrad uh, transcript was actually quite intimidating. But again, being somewhere away from people who know you, I actually just applied. I applied everywhere. And uh, fortunately, I had certain people who looked at my transcript. And I, my favorite question was somebody looked at my transcript and says, this third year thing you were here. And I said, yes. I said, so what was his name? Which I thought was <laughs> amazing insight and true. And, uh, and uh, so I ended up getting into medical school here at UBC and at Dalhousie and in Calgary and went to medical school. So fair enough, I went to medical school. And medical school was, this is being filmed, isn't it? A remarkable disappointment after science education. <laughs> at first, anyway, because it didn't, it wasn't problem solved. It was memorizing, and it it took it took me until about third year of medical school to realize that I had to memorize all that stuff to go back again to problem solving. Because one of the beautiful things about science is that it's problem solving, and it's you don't really actually have to memorize that many things as long as you understand the principles and what it is that you're trying to achieve. So I went to medical school at UBC, and just being having a convolute, liking to, liking to do things the hardest possible way, decided to have a baby in the middle of that. And, um, and the baby is Margaret's son's friend, <laughs> who's no longer me. And, um, and, then, um, and then another baby. And then I went into residency. And residency was an interesting thing because I think based on the fact that I had a scientific um, un, uh, background, I actually picked a relatively unusual specialty that specialty is public health. And the reason I picked that was because it's one of the most evidence-based um, and mathematically rigorous specialties. In other words, um, it, you basically have to prove that something is actually happening on a statistical mathematical basis before you have an intervention. It, you don't really react based on gut feeling. You react on evidence based on disease rates, changes in disease rates, and then trying to prove causation. So that's how I ended up where I am. And so right now, I'm one of the medical health officers here in Vancouver who's mostly working with communicable diseases. So for example, if you ever have someone coming into Langara and say there was a case of hepatitis A and this many people need a hepatitis A vaccine, that's the kind of work that I do. But the thing that I, um, I wanted to tell you about a science education, which is sort of, as you can see, yes, it was sort of a bit of a convoluted way of getting to medical school. And in fact, I probably went to medical school about four years later than most of my colleagues. And often I worried that I, you know, what was, what, what did I gain during those four years? And it wasn't really until recently where, where I have the opportunity to interact with a lot, a, a lot of other health professionals and making decisions that I realize what it is that I learned and what it is that I bring to the table because I did do science. And that's scientific thinking and rational thought. You'd be surprised how few decisions in the world are made based on evidence. And so whether you end up being a, a true practicing scientist or a physician or a teacher or a lawyer or a politician, if you have a good grounding in science, you will be the one person at the table who is able to make decisions and conclusions that have internal logic. 
And when I look back on the, what the most important course I took in my undergraduate, it's probably something called real analysis. Real <laughs> analysis. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Okay. It's like uber Seriously. rigorous calculus. Pardon? It's uber rigorous calculus. But it's not even the calculus so much as just, just really proving theorems, right? <clears throat> and, and the beauty of real analysis, um, uh, apart from the fact that you're in a class with all boys, is, uh, <laughs> is uh, the fact that um, you take a few assumptions, a few mathematical assumptions, by which you have to prove a theorem. And the only thing that, that you have to stick to is your assumptions and some basic mathematical principles. So what it really teaches you, as you said, is rigorous thinking. It is rigorous, logical thinking. And I actually think that was probably the most important course I ever took because um, it's surprising how little of that there is in the decision making in the world today. And whatever, whatever decisions you end up making as professionals uh, when you're done your education, and, and, and by that I mean the broad range of professionals, if you're the person who has had a, a rigorous scientific education, if you're the person who can point out when there are flaws in logic or when the, the conclusions that people are making aren't consistent with the assumptions that they have made, you will bring an enormous amount to the table. Because first of all, it, it, um, it carries a lot of weight. And because it is, it is, again, quite surprising how many decisions are made on belief, on bias, on hunch, um, and rather than on the evidence that's presented for and if a scientific, and one of the, I think, you know, we talked a little bit about our children. Um, I have kids right now who are just early high school to, to um, uh, early elementary school. And if what a scientific education brings you is an opportunity to, to teach children in a rigorous and scientific manner, then you will again bring something to their, um, to their education that very few people do. Um, I think one of the things that, um, that is missing um, in I think society at large is exactly that scientific thinking. So when, when, when I'm talking about the lack of scientific thinking, the things I'm talking about are, for example, when people try to associate measles, mumps, rubella vaccine to autism. Have you heard about that? How many people have heard about that measles, mumps, rubella vaccine may be related to autism? Well, it isn't. It never was. It never has been. And <laughs> And, um, and in fact, um, the association was reported by people who have been, um, well, by the, by the court of their scientific peers condemned, uh, um, condemned for scientific fraud. And um, there is, there's plenty of evidence out there that shows that, in fact, measles, mumps, rubella um, does not cause autism. There's no association whatsoever. And that if you stop vaccinating against measles, mumps, rubella, outbreaks start especially outbreaks of measles in which children die. And despite a very, very large body of evidence, there is this belief that persists. And, and you go onto the internet and you hear from people about, um, about uh, how there is an association. And people bring out individual bits of data that, um, that are refuted by large bodies of data, but they simply don't understand how to interpret data, how to interpret information scientifically. And, and, there, and sometimes you sit, listen to the radio as well, and you hear things that, that just strike you as, as this is just, just wrong. One of the things that I, for example, found very, um, very disturbing is I was listening to the radio about a month ago, and they were talking about the concern um, about the rates of sexual activity among young people. And they were saying that that uh, a much higher percentage of children under 12 um, are, are, who are sexually active are um, victims of sexual abuse than people who are 14 to 16. Well, every child who's sexually active at age 12 is a victim of sexual abuse. So it's just a terrible, terrible way of interpreting data because they didn't look at the definition of what they were saying. A 16 years, a group, you take a group of 16 year olds, some of them will be sexually active out of choice. You take a group of 12 year olds, probably none of them will be. Therefore, a higher percentage of 12 year olds will be involved in sexual activity against their will. So it was a terrible, terrible description of data. 
Or this morning on the radio, they said, big concern in northern British Columbia because a third of hospitals don't deliver babies. Well, that doesn't mean anything. What if there's two thirds of hospitals well distributed delivering babies? Half the hospitals in Vancouver don't deliver babies. So again, it was just people randomly picking out data that actually doesn't mean anything. And so the reason I bring up these examples is because I think it's important when you're at this stage of your education to value it for its own sake, to value it for the principles it teaches you, the way of thinking it teaches you. And while it's important to think about goals, I think a little bit from my, my experience, it's also really important to be open to the opportunities that come to you, even if they weren't what you had planned originally. So I'm not a theoretical chemist. I'm not a professor of theoretical chemistry at MIT. That's OK. Um, and, uh, and, but I think everything I learned along the way um, helps me do the job that I do today, which seems very uh, perhaps counterintuitive. And really what, I, what should really be helping me is medical school. But in reality, what was, what's re and that was the helps. <laughs> But, uh, but I think what's really helping is the fact that I, um, that I was taught by um, chemistry professors, by mathematics professors, and by physics professors on the importance of, of looking at information objectively, evaluating information, and advocating for its use to make decisions. So that's kind of my story. And uh, do you have any questions? You mentioned that when you did go to medical school, you were uh, several years older than mm -hmm. most of your cohort. Would that have changed at all in, in more recent times, or is oh, it yeah. still very much just young? No, no, it's, it's a lot more people now have master's degrees, people come with law degrees, people come with engineering degrees. So yeah, that, that is changing quite a bit now. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's good. Uh, I think it, it, it means that positions are broader group of people. Um, but um, so no, I mean, I, I wasn't that much older than there were, lots, there were people who were a lot older than me. But for me, I wasn't I wasn't the 21 year old. Um, and in a way, that was good. Um, and it was interesting also going through medical school having a baby. And I think that's the other thing that I often think when people are pursuing their education, that people have these preconceived notions of like, I, I gotta get my education done, I gotta get my job, and then I'm gonna have children. And, and, to wing it a little. Winging it is good. Um, um, having had a baby, in, I haven't had a baby in second year medical school, so I, I, was, I, I timed it perfectly, finished exams on the 24th, baby was born on the 30th. <laughs> and, um, and it was really, really hard. But it also gave you a perspective of what's important and what's not. And, and so that's the other thing is I, I don't, um, I think a, a lot of times, especially through education, we have, you know, we have a path, a path that we uh, we uh, set out for ourselves with a specific end. And if you're passionate about the end, that's great. But if you if you're just sort of trying to explore, I think this this is a really important time to explore. And, and um, I think there's a lot of so when I when I look at the the people with whom I went to undergraduate chemistry, I have. One person who ended up doing a master's in chemistry and works for a local biotech company. I work with so, someone who did a PhD in chemistry and works for Environment Canada, doing environmental studies. One of them is a lawyer and I'm a physician. So this is four of us. There's four of us met in first year, um, literally first day of first year science. We met at the steps of, steps of the bookstore. And so that's where we all ended up. Oh, sorry, I'm a fifth one. So in fact, uh, we all took very different paths and I think found the right ones for us. Yeah. Um, your remark about the 12 year olds engaged in sexual activity and <clears throat> how data is represented struck a chord with me because I attended a, a presentation by a professor in the School of Population and Public Health at UBC and um, they, it was about um, sexual activity in First Nations um, kids and a relationship to um, First encounter with legal differently. Mm -hmm. And on this poster it said, average age of sexual initiation, six years old. And I remember being grossly offended by that mm -hmm. because, you know, that's the flip side of what you're talking about. You know, you know, it's sexual initiation is not an appropriate term when no. you're talking about six-year-olds. And scientists 
just like media shouldn't right. be alarmist, scientists sometimes need to step away from that mm -hmm. clinical language and, and call a spade a spade. Yeah, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. And that's the other thing, actually, again, brings me to something that is, I see a really important part of my job is lots of people collect data. Lots of people analyze data, they put it in graphs, and then we make decisions completely independent of those data. And I think the best decisions are made when those of us who know what it means actually advocate for its use. And so an example that you probably all relate to is the H1N1 pandemic. Yeah. What happened with the H1N1 pandemic is an enormous outcry when vaccine was in shortage. There wasn't enough vaccine and everybody said, why not me first, why not me first, why not me first? And the reason that I wasn't first <laughs> is because there were excellent data collected on who was getting the sickest. And so everybody who was in the hospital with H1N1 had data collected on, on their age, on their risk factors, on, um, on the severity of their outcome. So one of the things we did as a country and again, this was a scientific way of looking at it, is let's take the people who died from this infection, the people who ended up in the ICU, and the people who ended up in hospital, and look at what they looked like. And what they looked like was they had underlying medical conditions like diabetes or asthma, they were pregnant women, or they were very young children. So when there were hardly any doses of vaccine around, we were able to make a database decision on who's going to get those very few doses first. And so I think that was an example of data actually driving decision making the way it ought to. I don't know if we communicated it to the public very well, um, but um, but I think I, I, I think you're I think that was where where you you're right. You don't just present the data without feeling or passion or even interpretation. I think your job as a scientist is to observe, gather, present, and advocate for the use of it. John, I had some very interesting undergraduate jobs. It was my first job. Um, the first year, I worked at Macmillan Lodell Research, and I was, which was a fantastic job. It was my degree. And what I was doing is, it, so this was in the summer. Um, actually, I actually had some really fun job, job experiences where I was making little pancakes of, of um, pulp. Um, from good wood fibers and bad, bad wood fibers and figure out which one could make whiter paper. So I did that. And then two summers, I worked um, with a, again, in research and science, and this was really fun. I got to carve a styrofoam deer. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And then put wires around it and then put the coat of a white-tailed deer out and then we took it up to the forest in northern Vancouver Island to demonstrate how the microclimate in new growth forests changed from the microclimate in old growth forests and how the temperature regulation of white-tailed deer prevent them from going into new growth forests. I did that for two summers. And then I, then I stopped doing those kind of jobs and I just found myself an ordinary job and I worked at a bed store and I was selling these full mattresses. <laughs> and yes, I worked in bedding. And, um, but the best thing about that job was that the very first day I got there, a woman came and she was a cavalarian. I didn't know what a cavalarian was. So I'm very first day, I'm the newbie, right? And these mattresses cost thousands of dollars. And so I get the, the speech about how you sell mattresses. I mean, I have this little booklet that said, sell, sell, sell. And, um, and, this, and so the, the head of the shop is, is um, busy talking to a customer. And this other woman comes in and she's a cavalarian. And she was opening a home for children with Prader-Willi syndrome. Now, Prader-Willi syndrome is a genetic illness that prevents you from, from knowing that you're full. So uh, the, the, the difficulty with these children is that they get extremely obese. So this woman walked in and buy, bought eight $2,000 mattresses from me the very first day. I had a job for the rest of undergrad. They loved me. <laughs> so I did that. And um, I'm just thinking, what, what other? So those are the, so I did, I did work, and then I did that part time. 
I didn't do a lot of work part time. I mean, I think that's I think that makes it a lot more challenging uh, when you do, when you do work part time. I think it's I think it's good to do. A lot of people get good work experience that way. But uh, those were, those are the ones that I did. I didn't do anything else. I think that was it. Yes. So I have a bit of a challenge for you about your comment on uh, scientists advocating, or just a bit something to discuss. Um, I watched the, or I listened to an NPR Science Friday uh, program a while ago, and they uh, they interviewed a uh, someone who wrote a book on global warming, mm -hmm. and he was making the point that um, that scientists are too much playing the role of the politician, mm -hmm. and they're they're using their scientific credentials as um, as a false sort of um, boost of their authority mm -hmm. to make political calls mm -hmm. uh, when really there's not um, there's not too much of a clear connection. So maybe you have some insight on that and, and it's, it's real in public health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do actually. I, we think about that a lot. And um, I think the scientist that gathers the information and publishes the information cannot be the same person who advocates for its importance. So what I'm saying is that you, you as a scientist have a project and you come up with results. You publish it. You cannot be the same person who advocates for the importance of those results because there's a clear conflict of interest there, right? And so for example, uh, there's a, again, um, excellent example from, um, from the radio. Uh, there was a study maybe about a year ago I was listening to and it was Dr. Mark Fitzgerald who's a who's a respirologist here in, in uh, Vancouver who was talking about a study they found that children who take a lot of Tylenol as, um, as infants, um, or there's an association between the amount of Tylenol you, Tylenol you take in your childhood and, and childhood asthma. Yeah. And do you remember that? Yeah. And so he was asked, um, do you think there should be a warning label on Tylenol? And his answer was very appropriately, um, I'm a scientist, these are my results, I leave that up to the regulators. So what yeah. I'm, and, and that's exactly Yeah, right. but the regulators, I'd say the regulators have a responsibility to consult people like him. Yeah, and to be the aware regulators do, and I think the regulators, um, at least among some of the regulators, there need to be some scientists who are able to validate the evidence. Exactly. So that conflict is very real and it's very important. So one of the places where I worry about that a little bit is, you know, there are a lot of people doing um, studies on on injection drug use and insight and all that. It's yeah. very important that the, the scientist who does that study is separate from the person who advocates for its use and its importance because they're in fact two different things. And so we recognize that especially in public health. So for example, uh, you know, we made decisions about vaccines, about which vaccines are gonna be funded, which are going to be part of the routine schedule. So what we then have is, if we ever, which we very rarely do, but even if we have um, someone present original, their original data to us, um, to the committee who makes those decisions, they then leave and we consider those data in the context of data from everyone else. So um, I think that's a very important point to make. So when I say advocate for the use of data, it's, this, it's subtly but importantly different from advocating for the importance of your own findings. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes, Katie. Your site on the site is your source of the country. Nearly failing third year seems to have worked. You know, I think honesty. Like, I think, I, think, I actually think that, um, that getting into medical school has a lot to do with the person you are. And, um, and what I would suggest to anyone who's considering that as a goal is to follow whatever you're passionate about, because uh, that's what you're gonna be the best at. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, medicine is a great job, but there's lots of other great jobs. So I guess, um, I think, again, for me, it was really good that it, I applied not with a class full of people who also wanted to go to medical school, but that it was just sort of a thought that naturally emerged. And I think that's another thing that that um, the people I respect the most in their careers 
are people for whom it's developed organically. So they studied something they were interested in, geology, whatever, and, and did the best they could at it. And then an interest naturally evolved. To give you an example, this isn't about science, but he's now my brother-in-law. But this is a fellow who um, worked in the steel mill, because his dad worked in the steel mill, and he didn't like that. So then he went and did an undergraduate degree in science, and that was kind of fun. And then he decided um, that, uh, that um, he was going to do, I think, I don't know, I don't know if he did a master's, but then he decided to go to law school. and. That was kind of cool, and then he did a master's in political science, and now he's one of the uh, deputy prosecutors for one of the war crimes tribunals in uh, the UN. So I guess what I'm saying is that every single thing he did, he did because he was interested. So you can go from the steel mill to um, an international court of law as long as you're interested in what you're doing at the time. So I think um, that, I, I would say that's probably the best way to do it, and maybe a good luck. Uh, but um, but I think it's one of the things that uh, that I, I don't think is is always helpful is to be in a class full of people who are all trying to get to this goal. One of the things that I found is a lot of people who started their education saying I'm going to go to medical school. Of the few people who actually left medical school, it was them. They never actually thought about whether or not they want to do that as a job. That's the other thing I think about any education is just think about what you want to do every day. One of the things that, um, one of the reasons I think I ended up in public health is because I'm a bit of a ham, and um, in public health you get to talk to a bunch of people, and you get to make an argument, and you get to make try to convince people of a point of view, and uh, that's not something you get to do in individual practice. So that's thing. One thing that's worth doing while you're doing the education is think about what it is, what is the one thing that you feel you bring to the table. And uh, there's a wonderful book, a local book called uh, Everyone Everyone Else is a, Everyone I Know is a Superhero, or All My Friends Are Superheroes, or something like that. And it's, um, it, it analyzes people's foibles and characteristics that every one of them makes them a superhero in one way or another. And it's a really neat thing to think about, um, think about what it is that, that you're good at. Do you have any thoughts on science education in Canada in uh, high school, right? Uh, compared with other countries, Eastern Europe, Germany, um, uh, splitting up into streams. My, uh, my math teacher from Vietnam studied things in high school that, that I see in third year. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So I do. I came to Canada having finished grade six in Hungary, and the only thing I learned by grade 12 in Canada that I didn't learn in Hungary by grade six was exponentials. So the actual body of knowledge that I had was larger. Um, and I think, on the other hand, uh, in a lot of those places, science and math is taught by rote. Um, and so there is, there is um, I think, my dad put it the best, because he was an engineer trained in Hungary, and he said, if a problem is in front of me, I am much more likely to have seen a similar problem in my education. But if a problem is in front of a Canadian engineer, if neither of us have ever seen anything similar, they will have more guts to try and solve it based on just solving a problem. So. So scientific education is different in other countries. I think one, one place where we, um, I think we could improve, and I think is a, a real difference, is that kids have, until grade seven, they have a single teacher, and I don't think that a single teacher can necessarily meet the needs of, of a 13-year-old kid who may be scientifically or mathematically inclined. So I think one thing that's, that's better in some European systems is by middle school, you get taught math by someone with a math degree and science by someone with a chemistry, uh, by chem chemistry by someone with a chemistry degree, physics by someone with a physics degree. So the, what we don't do till high school, which is get people who are specialists in the area that you are studying, um, doesn't happens about four years earlier, and I think that's a really critical, important time, especially for science and math. Um, on the other hand, I think, Canadian education seems to be uh, really fostering the idea of problem solving um, rather than having sort of seen everything that may have ever been a 
heard. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm just addressing your point, the uh, coming from our family where there was streaming, active streaming going on through their education. Those kind of countries often throw away a large portion of the population that aren't ready to be streamed at some decided age. Um, sure. You know, whatever system you go through, there's a benefit and disadvantages. What they do now, which I think is interesting in um, some places where, or just coming out of communism, is that there's various times where you can be streamed. So you can stay general until grade four or grade six or grade eight. Or and I think the other thing that that is a bit of an advantage of those systems is that people end up in in technical and trades jobs and actually become skills, really skilled trades folks exactly. in a way that is often an afterthought for people here. And I think that's too bad because um, there's a whole lot of value in that. So, but I think each system is has its. Um, has its advantages and disadvantages. My husband's a statistics professor, so every time I go on about the value of mathematics education in Hungary, he does point out that we're not exactly leading the universities and the scientific research. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, but I think, I think there are nuances. I think the one thing that I would really, really like to see is people with a solid science training in the elementary grade. Certainly. I think that would yeah. be a huge benefit for everyone.